chapter 6 verse 12 it says for we wrestle not against flesh and blood our warfare is not against men in in flesh bodies it says but against what principalities against powers against the rulers of darkness of this world against spiritual wickedness in high places that is what our warfare is against and all this antagonism all this you know uh, um, attack towards man is because the eternal God chose man to be his dwelling place. And he sparked a jealousy. And all, have all the realms of the spirit that is in opposition to God decided to, you know, to make sure man does not fulfill that purpose of God. But we thank God through our Lord Jesus Christ who has saved us and called us and, will, and continue to minister grace and strength unto us. And... Uh, uh, he shall, uh, he has promised to bring us into the fulfillment of his counsel in the name of Jesus. And so shall it be uh, concerning us in Jesus' mighty name. So we'll continue to talk about what uh, for we'll continue from what we spoke about yesterday the rule of the body, holiness, and divine order. And we must know that we are the body of Christ. And he dwells in us, and we dwell in him. He dwells in us, and we dwell in him. And uh, God, has, God has packaged the matters of perfection and glory. The matters of perfection and glory has been packaged in something called the body. Something called the body. There's a song I love. It says, he's building a body. Sorry, I just want to, I like to sing, even though I, I don't have a good voice. You know, so, but very long of me. He's building a body in the earth today. He's building a body. Oh, yeah. It is not of clay. It's not of clay. It's a spiritual body to the glory of God. Oh, to the glory of God. He's building a body. Oh, in the earth today. And then it says, find your place in that body in the earth today. Oh, yes, get into God's order, not man's order. Oh, and learn to obey. Oh, oh the dead to self message. It will show you the way. He's building a body in the earth today. God is building a body. Jesus made an eternal statement before he left the scene. I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. Think about that church from the two principles. Number one, you. Jesus has promised he will build you and the gates of hell will not prevail over your life. Whatever weakness, whatever hindrance that may stand in your way today, whatever giant may stand before you, it will be decimated, totally destroyed by the power and by the life of Christ that is in you. And also, his body corporately he says, building his body, his true church, and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. So God is building a body. He's building a body. And men must willingly obey the rules of the body, which is holiness. Let us look, read Ezekiel chapter 43, verse 12. Ezekiel chapter 43, verse 12. Ezekiel 43, verse 12. Ezekiel 43, verse 12, where are we there? It says, Ezekiel 43, verse 12. Ezekiel is, ooh, yeah. Ezekiel 43, okay. 
He says, this, yeah, 43. Yeah, 43. <laughs> Ezekiel 43, verse 12. It says, this is the law of the house. This is the law of the house. Upon the top of the mountain, the whole limit thereof, round about, shall be most holy. Behold, this is the law of the house. Upon the mountains, the whole limit on the top of the mountain, upon the top of the mountain, the whole limit thereof, the area surrounding, that's what it means by the whole limit thereof, shall be most holy. Holiness. The Bible says, holiness becometh my house. Um, that's on that scripture I quoted. The law of the house is holiness. Holiness. And that scripture says, you shall be holy unto me, for I, the Lord, I am holy. And that is the only way. Isaiah says, who amongst us shall dwell with the everlasting burning? The only way you can dwell with the everlasting fire is that you are fire yourself. Only fire can survive <laughs> in fire. Anything that is not fire, that is thrown into fire, is, is, is burnt, is consumed. So it's holiness, holiness and divine order can see matters of that in Colossians chapter 1, verse 8. I'm not necessarily going to read. And 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 12 to 31. And we can see matters talking about divine order in the, in, the in the body of Christ. So God has called us to partner with him through willing obedience. Through willing obedience to build his body. And the order of, the, of building is individual and corporate. That means we must build ourselves individually. Read our Bibles. Give time to the word of God. Pray. Do not leave your house a day, even if it's a verse of scripture. Hold it. Hold a verse of scripture. Even if it's for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Whosoever believeth on him should not perish, but should have everlasting life. Hold it. As you go to work, you are, you are thinking about it. That is called meditation. Forget what the guys that do yoga have told us about Meditation. They are involved in a lot of dark things. It's not med meditation is not, on, on, it's not only when I take a particular posture, you know, and I keep my face in a serious, then I'm meditating. No. You meditati meditation simply means thinking more about a thing, about a matter. As we're going, you know, God so loved the world. Anything that we give thoughts, more thoughts to, you know, we always... Um, uh, if, in fact, even in things that are natural in life, you, you can read more meaning into a thing if you give thoughts to it, even a meaning that was not even there <laughs> in the first place. But when it comes to matters of the spirit, the Holy Spirit is waiting for us to actively meditate upon his word. The Bible says, my meditation of him shall be sweet. So give them to building yourself individually, as an individual, praying, meditating on the word of God, reading your Bible, you connection, you know, someone spoke about the Eden experience. That is incredibly powerful. The experience in Eden, receiving refreshing, refreshing from the presence of God. Oh, the Eden experience is something we can, it is a, a beautiful topic for us to talk about. And we see the ministry of the, the, the river of God coming. It says a river went out from Eden. Parting into four heads from the river Pison, the one that flows to the land of Havila. It says, There, there is the gold, the delium, and the onyx stone, and the Hidekel, and the, and the Euphrates. Those things, beautiful things to talk about. Experiences that flows from uh, you know, a life of fellowship with the Lord. Those things have applications to our lives. And this is something we must not. Anything we see in the scripture, in the Bible, don't look at it as just mere history or stories. They are speaking of you and I and our life in Christ Jesus. You know, so that is it, individual, that Eden experience. And then corporately, when we come together, when we all have that Eden experience and we come together, we, we bring down a greater deluge of the glory of God. You know, praise the name of the Lord. So, now we'll quickly just speak in the next in few minutes, we will now talk about now seeing talking about the house of God and you know the Lord has de determined to dwell in us. We are going to look to this is just to encourage us 
of the abundant provisions that the Lord has made available for us to come into his glory. And it's not, it may not be, it may not, we are just encouraging ourselves, it may not be loaded with instructions, as I will put it, but it's just to encourage us, to let us know that abundant provision has been made for us to come into this glory, for us to come into this splendorous house that God has determined. And we will begin to examine some prophetic insights, and, and we should follow closely, that gives light to the works of God towards his body in bringing her into glory. Some prophetic insights that will give us light to the workings of God. To the workings of God towards his body. Towards his body. Now we know when we say towards his body, let's not think far. Speaking of me and speaking of us as we gather, as we, as we are gathered like this. This is the body of Christ. You know, and God is doing a work to bring us to, to his glory, to bring us to Zion, the glory of God. He says he will take two of a family. He will take one of a city. And what did he say he would do to them? I want to see if we... <laughs> he said he will take two of a family, one of a city. Is it uh, Isaiah? He says, and he will bring them to Zion. Two of a family, one of a city, and he will bring them to Zion. And the psalmist, is it Ethan or, or one of them? He says, for thou hast holding me by my right hand. Thou shalt guide me with thy counsel, and thereafter thou shalt receive me to glory. Praise the name of the Lord. That is it. That is the journey, is to bring us to glory. That, what does that mean? Two of a family, one of a city. God will pick all those who are following him faithfully, following him according to his order. He said he shall bring them. He shall pick them, and he shall bring them unto Zion. But let's not deviate much. So we have established that being saved is the beginning of our journey to the fullness of of God's order and glory, and it is not an end in itself. So that's something. We are on a journey. Being saved is the beginning of the journey. And God is in the business of perfecting his body through Christ Jesus, who has made abundant provisions for it. He has made abundant provisions for it. It's not uh, someone, Jesus did not, it's not, he did not die suddenly without any plan and no will, you know, just like in the, in the natural, you know, someone, oh, my, my you know, so someone can say, oh, my dad just died suddenly, nothing, there was no plans for us, and maybe you find out that you had to inherit all these things, and there was, there is nothing on ground, you know, but uh, we cannot even use that, that's not even a perfect case to use to compare with Jesus, because Jesus died, but he's not dead, <laughs> you know, he's died, but he's not dead, but Jesus before his departing, made abundant provision. And what is that abundant provision? His resurrection. Glory to God! His resurrection is the abundant provision that he made. And that he shall visit us, he shall visit us greatly. And by his, his resurrection brought, gave us many benefits, many things that will ensure that we come into the glory of God. Now, let us make a statement. Let us understand something. And we're going to use it as a prophetic key. And we are going to look on that. Because of the scripture we want to read, let us understand something about the character, as well as many other characters in scripture, but about the character David, King David. Let us understand something about this character. There are many of these characters of such in scripture. But for what we want to read, we'll understand something about David. David, the man, David, served as a direct type to the Lord Jesus Christ. He was a figure of Christ. And he was set to, to be a mirror of the Lord's salvation. So he was set to mirror God, what God's salvation will look like from an earthly, in an earthly lens. In fact, Jesus in the book of Revelation chapter 22 verse 16 is called the root and the offspring of David. And I'm going this, the rest I'll move fast, but it's necessary to understand this, that Revelation chapter 22, verse 16, Jesus is called the root and the offspring. Jesus is called the root and the offspring of David. The root and the offspring of David. What does that mean? 
The root simply means he's the ancestor of David. He brought David forth. He's like David's father. But the offspring, it means at the same time, he's David's son. And that is a key. So that's why when he was on scene, they would say, Jesus, Jesus, son of David. But after some time, they were calling him son of David. And, you know, then Jesus was making a statement at, at the time. And Jesus said, look, Jesus said, you guys are saying, you guys keep on saying, because they were saying it a lot of times. Jesus said, you guys keep on saying that the Messiah is the son of David. They say, yeah. They said, okay. Jesus said, how come in the spirit David called him Lord? Saying, the Lord said unto my Lord, sit down at thy right hand until I make thine enemies thy footstool. That is Psalm 110, verse 1, I'm, I'm quoting. Jesus said, how come then in spirit David calls him father? But you are saying he's the so Jesus' son of David. But in spirit, David called him Lord. So Jesus was trying to show something, you know, that for, for, the, for the purpose of teaching, and that certain things respecting salvation can be communicated to us. He's called the root and the offspring of David. He's David's father and he's David's son. And that is a prophetic key we can use to understand certain things, certain scriptures, you know, even in the, in, in the Old Testament. So even the casual life of David, his casual day-to-day -day living, he was so much a mirror of Christ that his casual day-to-day -day living was symbolizing Christ and the earthly display of the Godhead was tied to him for the purpose of teaching. So one day, David just went to a, to a field. He just went to a field and he, you know, uh, not to a field. David, one day David just went, you know, somewhere and uh, Saul was pursuing him and he took bread from the temple, you know, he took bread from the temple, from the, from the, this tabernacle, or, you know, the temple of God, he took holy bread that was on the table, and because he asked the priest, um, my men are hungry, and they said, well, there's nothing, it's only holy bread that we have. Do you know what it means? For a man, David was not even from the tribe of Levi, to eat holy bread, and took it and ate, and gave to the men that were with him. And Jesus, on that day, was on the scene, and Jesus was with his disciples. And I forgot what happened. Whether they ate something in the... It, it, um, I'm not getting the story uh, accurately. Either it was the Sabbath or something. And they ate. They ate corn on the field. And the people said, look, what are you doing? Jesus said, having to read what David did, how he and the men that were with him ate shoe bread. Can you imagine? Wow. <laughs> that simple thing David did was mirroring Christ. Even when David's son was pursuing him, Absalom pursued him, and there was a particular valley, I think it was the, the Kidron or something, forgot the particular place David walked through, that was the same place Christ walked through when he was going to the cross. His daily life was just figuring, was a figure of Christ. So David was set from the foundation of the world to be a mirror of Christ for the purpose of teaching the saints at these times. Certain things, certain mysteries regarding, uh, you know, the Lord's uh, um, um, salvation. So everything was always a pointer to, to Christ. Let us take, for example, Psalm 16, you know, before we enter. And if you look at Psalm, Psalm 16, for, for example, verse the whole thing, you can be reading this scripture, Psalm 16. Preserve me, O God, for in thee I put my trust and so on and so forth. But not knowing that this entire thing, David is actually speaking about Jesus Christ, about his suffering and when he was in the grave <laughs> and his victory. David was talking about Christ in spirit. And what he's speaking as though he's speaking about himself. And if you look at the verse, verse um, Psalm 16, Psalm 16, you know, and if you look at verse, um, verse, verse 10, it says, For thou will not leave my soul in hell, Neither will thou suffer thine holy one to do what? To see corruption. Thou will show me the path of life. In thy presence is fullness of joy. At thy right hand are pleasures forevermore. And we read this, wow, hmm, what is David going through here? You know, but not knowing that he's actually experiencing, he's actually um, um, you know, displaying the passions of Christ. He was so one in spirit with Christ that sometimes he speaks and he displays the passions, the emotions of Christ. <laughs> and 
um, in Acts, let us look at what was commented about this scripture we just read, Psalm 16, in the book of Acts chapter 2, verse 25. Acts chapter 2, verse 25. So we know that the Old Testament is not, is not the Lord has given us access by his spirit to understand the things that pertain to our salvation and our inheritance in it. All scripture has been given by God for the purposes of of the church. Amen. So Acts chapter 2, two verse 25. When Peter was speaking on the day of Pentecost, Peter quoted this scripture. He says, for David speaketh concerning him. So in the book of Acts, I don't know if we are there. Chapter 2, verse 25. It says, for David speaketh concerning Christ, saying, I foresaw the Lord always before my face. His note, he's quoting Psalm 16. For he is on my right hand that I should not be moved. He said, therefore, my heart rejoiced and my tongue was glad. Moreover, my flesh also shall rest in hope because thou will not leave my soul in hell. Neither will thou suffer thine holy one to see corruption. Thou hast made known to me the ways of life. Thou shall make me full of joy with thy countenance. Then he said, verse 29, men and brethren, let me freely speak to you of the patriarch David, that he is both dead and buried, and his grave is with us unto this day. Because David in Psalm 16 says, you will not leave my soul in hell. You will not leave me in the grave. You will not allow my, my body to, to decay. That's what it means when he says, you will not allow your Holy One to see corruption. But he said, let's remind ourselves that but this guy is dead. <laughs> He's in the grave. His, his, his grave is with us to this day. Verse 30, he says, therefore, being a prophet... And knowing ha, that God has sworn with an oath unto him that of the fruit of his loins, according to the flesh, he would raise up Christ to sit on his throne. Praise God. It says, he seen this before, spoke of what? The resurrection of Christ, that his soul was not left in hell, neither his flesh did see corruption. So Psalm 16 was just talking about the resurrection of Christ. And I tell you, all the Psalms are speaking various aspects of the life, the resurrection, the death, the suffering of Christ, which is tied to our victory. And on that time, we would see how we can use the, the, the Psalms, connect to the spirit of the Psalms to gain daily victories in our lives. All these things apply to us. Praise the name of the Lord. So, that is very clear. Say he spoke of the resurrection of Christ. And but verse 30 says, he knew that God, he knew that God had sworn with an oath to him that of the fruit of his loins, according to the flesh, he would raise up Christ to sit on the throne. And that even applies to even the physical fruit of David's loins, which came via Solomon. These things are all pointers to Christ. Okay, let us proceed from there. So even though aspects of David's natural life, you know, we are written, the Holy Spirit shows us where to draw prophetic inspiration regarding the work of Christ in our lives. Solomon, being the son of David, serves as a prophetic type of Christ, who is the son of David, and also, likewise, the church. Because the church is the seed of Christ, the seed of David, you know. Uh, and uh, so the, the seed of Christ, the church is the seed of Christ spiritually. All right. So having established that, I'm not going to labor f- further to talk about that. Let us move to and encourage ourselves, you know, briefly. It's going to be a short one today regarding the provisions that Christ has made unto us. But it was necessary to understand this so that we can have more appreciation for the scripture. Okay, so we'll go to the text that gave us the topic. Uh, First Chronicles chapter 22. First Chronicles chapter 22. Okay. Are we there? Are we there yet? (laughs) First Chronicles chapter 22. And we're just going to take one verse from here, and then we would proceed. First Chronicles chapter 22. 
And David said, Solomon, my son, is young and tender. Now with the understanding that we had, the, Spirit, the Holy Spirit can now begin to give us prophetic insight of what this is talking about and how this applies to us. And Jesus said, Solomon, my son, Solomon is the seed of David. And the, the seed of Christ, what is the seed of, of, of Christ? Remember when Adam fell, God said the seed, the seed of The seed of the woman, he said, the seed of the woman will bruise the head of the serpent. Now, the seed, what is the, of course, this was prophetically speaking of Christ and also sp uh, speaking of the church. So the seed of, of Christ, we are the seed of Christ, you know, and he's talking about us individually and us as a church. Okay, so David said, Solomon, my son, is young and tender. Is young and tender, and the house that is to be built dead for the Lord, that's where we got the topic, must be exceeding magnificent of fame and glory throughout all countries. I will therefore now make preparation for it. So David prepared abundantly before his death. Are we seeing that through a renewed lens now? Are we seeing that through a renewed lens? I can read it again to you and say, Jesus said, Chidera, my son is young and tender. You know, many times when we say we are young and tender, it could sometimes when we are just, you know, maybe giving our lives to Christ. I've just been a Christian for three months now, five months, you know, nothing. Or the church is just beginning young and tender. But he said something. It shows the thought in the mind of the father to make preparation for us. And we can be very well assured that he's leading us somewhere great. He says, they, but the problem is that, or the issue at hand, is that the house that is to be built, that is to, that is to be built to the Lord, must be magnificent. But the people who are here on ground are young and tender. He says, okay, I know what I'm going to do. He says, I am going to make preparation for it. And he said, David made preparation before his death. And we saw the preparation that Christ made for us, for his church, before he died. He made a lot of preparation. And that preparation was to be activated at his resurrection, of which when his resurrection came, he released unto us, poured unto us the Holy Spirit, which is our assurance to coming into that magnificent house. The house must be exceeding magnificent. I tell you, when God is done with you, whoo, where men have known you for shame and for loneliness, you shall be great, the joy of the, of the whole earth. Men shall run into you, shall, re, shall, shall run to you for rescue. The Bible says that saviors will come out from Mount Zion. People will come out. They will, if a man like Noah in the old time can be so powerful. How much more we under the, the covenant of the Lord Jesus Christ. When God is done with you, we shall be that exceeding magnificent house as an individual and also corporately. So let us be encouraged with what we are doing. When we are building the house of the Lord, this place we are coming, building, building, the Bible says, do not despise the days of little beginnings. So Solomon is young and tender, but this house is set for fame. Is set for glory. Is set for fame. Right now, there are other mountains that are having preeminence in the world. Remember, it was, we were told in Isaiah, it says that on, in that day, that the mountain of the house of the Lord shall be established on the top of the mountains. So there are other mountains, of mountains of, the ed of education, entertainment, industry is a mountain, is it careers, all manner of things, the financial mountains of the world, well, it says they shall come a day that the mountain of the Lord's house will be established on the top. It's a house set for fame, and it is to be for glory. And it says David made abundant preparation for it before he died. And this is speaking of the preparations that the Lord has made regarding us, that we can come into the reality of this house so exceeding magnificent, a house full of glory and splendor. 
First Timothy chapter 3, verse 15 corroborates this. It testifies of this thing that David said. Um, you know, um, I'll quickly uh, uh, read that. First Timothy, First Timothy chapter 3, verse, verse 15, where he says, But if I tarry long, that thou mayest know how thou oughtest to behave thyself in the house of God, which is the church of the living God. And he called it the pillar and the ground of truth. It's the pillar. Today, can we see and say that the church of the living God, today, can we say it is indeed acting as the pillar and the ground of truth? We can make those analyses. But God has called us to bring back that glory, to continue to prepare ourselves, living uh, uh, temples unto him. And as we submit to the rule of the body, we shall, uh, you know, comfort in levels of glory. All right, let us close with First Chronicles chapter twenty-nine. This is where we will stay, and then we would, we would end. First Chronicles chapter twenty-nine, and so that we can understand um, certain things. First Chronicles chapter twenty-nine. I'll read from verse one. It says, "Furthermore." David the king said unto all the congregation, Solomon my son, whom alone God had chosen, is yet young and tender. And speaking regarding his church, speaking regarding us in various aspects of our lives. And the work is great. And the palace is not to be a center. Now note, the palace, which is the word there, is the temple that is to be built, is not it is not for man. It's not for man. But he says that the palace is for God. Not so. That is what we are reading in the scripture. He says, and the palace is not for man. It's not going to be a center for man. You know, no. But the palace is for God. It's not for man, but it's for God. So he says, it's young and tender. The house to be built. So imagine us in circumstances of our lives. We, maybe we are low in faith. We are struggling in certain areas. And we are hearing about us being the temple of God. Showing the holiness of God. It's a wow. But Jesus understands those things. He sees us. And he knows our journey. He says, yeah. You are Solomon, my son. is young and tender. And this house that is to be built. It's not for something for man. But it is for God. He says, now. I have prepared. You know, I've made some, some comments. Sorry before that, about the young and tender state. Many times it's as just at the new birth. You could just be giving your life to Christ today, a few months ago. I'm young and tender. I'm young and tender. You know, but let us be careful. You know, because of in, as, as we say that, because we have abundant preparations have been made for us and has been made available to us by the Holy Spirit. And as we open ourselves to begin to receive it, to receive it we shall see endless dimensions of growth. Are you saying to yourself that you are young and tender today? Don't worry. God has made provisions for you. He, he, he said in the book of Luke chapter 12 verse 32, he says, fear not little flock, for it is my father's good pleasure to give unto you the kingdom. It's my father's pleasure to, give, to bring you into his glory. Don't ever struggle. Think that you need to begin to struggle. This is God's glory. No. As you open yourself up to the abundant provisions that have been released by reason of the resurrection of Christ, you will see that his yoke is easy indeed and his burden is light. As the Lord has been speaking to this house, his yoke is easy and his burden is light. The palace which there, of course, as I said, it means a temple. And he's speaking about God's body, individual and corporate. Remember, your body is the temple of the living God. Even Jesus himself began as that young and tender plant. You guys say, Solomon, my son, is young and tender. He was also speaking prophetically of Christ. Isaiah chapter 53, verse 1 and 2. We can see it there. Isaiah 53, verse 1 and 2. He says, verse 2 says, he shall grow up as a tender plant. He shall grow up as a tender plant and as a plant, I think, as a, uh, a sprouting from a dry ground. That's why he spoke that of Christ, Isaiah 53. When he says, who shall believe our report? And to whom is the hand of the Lord, uh, you know, extended. So, Solomon, my son, young and tender. But he says, um, he, verse 2, he says, Now I have prepared with all my might 
Let us get in touch with the mind of the Father respecting us. With all his might, he has prepared. For the house of my God, the gold for things of gold, and the silver for things of silver, and the brass for things of brass, and the iron for things of iron, and wood for things of wood, onyx stones, and stones to be set, glistering stones, and of diverse colors, and all manner of precious stones, and marble stones in abundance. Oh, abundant preparation was made. <laughs> he has prepared with all his might for the building of this house. He will begin it, he will lay the foundation, and he will complete it. That's why he says, Jesus, looking unto Jesus, who is the author and the finisher of your faith. That is, he began, your, he began it and he will perfect it. Gold for things of gold. He's speaking of things that pertain to us coming into the divine nature. Gold speaks of divinity. It speaks of majesty. When you see gold, it's, 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 uh, it's associated with majesty. So things that pertain to our coming into that divine nature has been given unto us by his divine power. Second Peter chapter 1, verse 3. Let's read it. Second Peter. So we can see this thing. Second Peter chapter 1, verse 3 and 4. It says, According as his divine power had given unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness, through the knowledge of him that has called us to where? To glory and virtue. Remember what did Peter say there? Through the knowledge of him that has called us. So the call is to glory and virtue. Virtue here is speaking of moral excellence. Ooh, glory. Moral excellence. So our call is to glory and virtue. That's the call. That's where we are going to. It says, through the knowledge of him that has called us to glory and virtue, whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises, that by this ye might be partakers of what? The divine nature. Hallelujah. The divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust, that we will escape human nature. He it says, it's, it's human nature. It's human. And many times we accept it. It's, we are humans. But God, by his divine power, has worked in us, giving us exceeding great and precious promises that to make, uh, and these things are to make us to become partakers of a divine nature. Of divine nature. So, gold for things of gold. Things that are needed for us to come into this has been given abundantly by the Lord. And he says by his divine power, he's abundant by reason of his resurrection. He says that same spirit that brought again our Lord Jesus from the dead. He says it is the same spirit that is able to quicken our mortal bodies. Hey, glory to God. And cause us to escape the hold of the natural affections of the flesh. By his spirit that works in us. Let our minds be renewed by this. Understand the power that is at work in you. And begin to, 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 to lay hold of your inheritance in Christ. Sometimes this thing is about understanding, enlightening. Enlightenment. Enlightenment. And then you can lay hold and, and enforce. Enforce the victories of God in your life. Silver for things of silver. The full work of redemption shall be experienced in our lives. Silver, of course, speaks prophetically of redemption, redemptive acts. Jesus was traded for what? 30 pieces of silver. It was the purchase, <laughs> the purchase of redemption. And Zechariah spoke about it when he talked about, Zechariah was speaking prophetically of Christ, how they, they prized him for 30 pieces of silver. He said, the price him. He said, is this the price? Is this my price? He said, go and cast it in the potter's house. He said, go and cast it in the potter's house. What a way they value me. They value me so cheap for 30 pieces of silver. And Zechariah was speaking of the betrayal of Jesus. Because when uh, Judas had finished, 
he went to the potter's house and he cast the money. <laughs> it's so beautiful. I mean, look at this thing. It's amazing. This is find the Old Testament. What does Zachariah have to do? Speaking with pinpoint accuracy. Thousands of years about things that will happen. So the price of redemption, silver. And that's why we, when we look at this tabernacle, we, we can look at the, there were things that were made of gold, things that were made of silver, things that were made of brass. All these things have meanings. They have meanings go I, I, into the temple. So much things that pertain for the full work. Now note, I said the full work of redemption. We receive redemption, but there is another redemption. Now note, <laughs> let's not be thrown off. That we must yet come into. Wow, there is another redemption. <laughs> what other redemption? It's all Christ. But we must come into one another. Let us quickly read it in first, in, uh, not first, Ephesians chapter 1. Let us quickly just look at it. Ephesians chapter 1. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 9. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 9. It says, Having made known unto us, the mystery of his will, according to his good pleasure, which he had proposed in himself. That in the dispensation, in the hour, in the era of the fullness of time, that he might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are in earth, even in him, in whom also we have obtained an inheritance, pre being predestinated according to the purpose of him that worked all things after the counsel of his own will, that we should be to the praise of his glory, note verse 12, who first trusted in Christ. So there's the place where he's talking about who first trusted. I shouldn't write because I don't have time to write. Okay. Who first trusted in Christ, in whom ye also trusted, after that ye heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation. So you experience redemption. It says, in whom also, after that you believed, you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. After you believe, you receive the Holy Spirit. It now says, which is the earnest. That word the earnest is the down payment. The earnest of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession. Unto the glory of God. Of his, unto the praise of his glory. Note the word, the redemption of the purchased possession. A purchased possession has already been redeemed. The Bible calls us the possession of Christ. We are the purchased possession, purchased by his blood. But then he's saying, and what he's talking about the redemption of the purchased possession. So that is speaking of our coming into the fullness of God. To further buttress that in the same Ephesians, no need for us to leave that book. Let us look at Ephesians chapter 4, verse 29. Just go some few more chapters. Ephesians chapter 4. Verse 29, it says, let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth. It's a call to holiness. But that, but that which is good, to the use of edifying, of building, that it may minister grace unto the hearers. And it now says, let, let, um, let all bitterness and wrath Yeah, where is it? 30. Okay, yeah, yeah. Yeah, sorry, I don't mind. I skipped it. <laughs> 30. It says, And grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby ye have been sealed unto the day of redemption. So there is, as we trust in God, as we are called, as we move, we have been, when we are called, the call of God is redemption. But when we are called, as we move, we continue to experience greater dimensions until we come into his fullness. Do you understand that? So that is the redemption. This is another redemption of the purchased possession of them that have been called. So there is a journey. There's a journey. As we go on, as we continue, we, com we continue to see more and more, experience more and more of the power of the life of Christ as we pursue after him. 
as we follow the principles of divine inquisition, if that grammar is too big, the principles of divine search, you know, it says asking, asking, uh, uh, um, ask and it shall be given unto you, seeking and knocking, asking, seeking and knocking. As we continue in those in those things, the Lord continues to show more of, of himself to us. Okay, we have a few minutes more, so I will just begin to wrap this up. So, silver for things of silver. For the things of silver, the blood of Jesus is particularly imp an important tool for us to enforce the realities of these things in our lives. We must know and understand the person, the entity of the blood of Jesus is an important tool to experience the, the, the full work of redemption in our lives. Let us continue to be a people that plead the blood of Jesus. In any circumstance of your life, when you come out of your house, I plead the blood of Jesus over my life. I plead. Men plead many things. You go to America, you ask, they ask somebody a question that may incriminate him and he does not want to answer it. He says, I plead the fifth amendment. I want to plead my fifth amend amendment right. Because if I answer, because it says no man should be allowed. It's a rule of law. No man, no man should be allowed to incriminate, or no man should be made to incriminate himself. That is why in a case of law, a, an accused cannot be made to testify if he does not want to. He, it is under his right. He cannot be made to testify if he does not want to. Because no man should be made to accuse himself. <laughs> you know, so people, ple I plead my fifth amendment right. Let us learn to plead the blood of Jesus. When you plead it, redemption means a remission. That means, number one, if you have been affected by a thing, it can be reversed, number one. Number two, redemption is also that the blood of Jesus is a covering. The Lord told Moses that they should put the blood, every man should take the blood and put it on the lintels of their door. If this is the door of their house, he said, apply the blood here. They put the blood the, the door of, of the house. You know, no, this, this is a very big door. Anyway, but they put the blood here so that when the angel of death was passing, any place that he saw the blood, he could not enter. And that is it. The blood of Jesus has been put over the, the symbolic lintels of our house, both as individuals and as a body. We must learn to apply the blood of Jesus because it is part of the abundant provision that has been made for things of silver. It says brass for things of brass. This is achieved by continuous entrance of the word of God into our lives. To bring judgment to all contradictory conditions. Brass prophetically speaks of judgment. So we see silver speaks divine divinity, uh, uh, gold divinity, silver redemptive works. Brass speaks of judgment. And it is the word of God that is a tool. To bring forth the judgment of God. When we receive the word of God, it judges us. It judges us and sorts things out. Judgment is a separation. And then, we ourselves also becomes, become instruments, you know, of the, Lord, of the Lord's judgment. Because who is he that has the power of judgment? It's him that has, that is be made one with the word. The word is Jesus. Because he's the one that all judgment has been given. So if we are one with him, then we have the scepter also with him. Praise the name of the Lord. So, brass for things of brass. That tabernacle we looked at, that brazen altar, it was made of bronze. Which was speaking of the cross of Christ. And judgment was done there. In the, uh, when he, he, he went to, Cal to Calvary, it was, it was judgment that sent him there for sin. And he also went there to execute judgment for us. To deliver us. From the hold of sin. So judgment. Brass speaks of judgment. We see the feet of brass in uh, Micah chapter 4 verse 13. You can check it. The feet of brass to execute judgment. So just as judgment brought us under the gate of iron and brass. Because I'm quoting Micah 4 verse 13. It says we uh, use uh, feet of iron and brass to trash. You know, Micah chapter, chapter uh, 4, verse 13, that says, Arise and thresh, O daughter of Zion, for I will make thine horn iron, and I will make thy hoofs brass. 
He says, arise and thresh. <laughs> That's what threshing is, what the Lord uses when he wants to judge. In Israel, they would take grapes. When they want to make wine, <laughs> you know, they would take grapes and put it on, it's called the threshing floor, and they would begin to thresh it. They would begin to match it. Then Jesus said, <laughs> he's going to, <laughs> Jesus said, I will trample them in my fury. He says, when he wants to exercise judgment, we can go and check it. The book of Isaiah, the book of, of Revelation. He says he would. So, and that is why when he was seen in the book of Revelation, they said that his feet were what? They were like shining brass. So to you to thresh. When the Lord wants to arise in judgment, to thresh. So I'm just showing you why we say brass speaks prophetically of judgment. So he says for brass, things of brass, everything that will bring the reality of God's judgment in our lives. Abundant provision has been made for it. And we must know. For brass, for the things of brass. Iron for things of iron. Everything necessary for you to exercise God-given dominion has been provided for you. In the beginning, God said, let us make man and let him have dominion over all realms of the heavens of the earth, under the sea. And iron speaks of dominion. In Psalm 110, it says, uh, rule thou in the midst of thy enemy. In Psalm 2 verse 8, it says, And thou shalt rule the nations with what? A rod of iron. <laughs> and Revelation 2 verse uh, 27, it says, He bought, bought for the man-child, uh, no, is it? I don't think, uh, two, uh, that's, it talked about man-child in Re Revelation 2. But Revelation 2 verse 27 talks about him ruling with a rod of iron. So that iron speaks of dominion. The same way the devil had us under the gates, it call, it's called the gates of iron and brass. The same way, as the, by the work of redemption, we, we own those things, iron and brass, dominion and judgment. And that has been given to us by the Lord Jesus Christ. Onyx stones speaks of things given for living and walking in the spirit. These stones are found in the pockets, they are found in pockets of gold on the garment of the high priest, Exodus 39, verse 6. Exodus, Exodus 39, verse 6. So onyx stones, we can speak more of these things, but it can speak of life in the spirit. Because they are always found in the presence of God. They are glistering stones. Okay, let us complete the reading and then we close in the scripture that we we hear. Um, um, in uh, First Chronicles, chapter 3, we'll complete the reading and then we can begin to pray. We don't have time to go in. It says, so, so we can see how that applies to us, verse 2. And then verse 3, we'll just take maybe three more verses, just read. Moreover, because I have set my affection to the house of my God, because... I have set my affection to the house of my God. I have of my own proper good of gold and silver, which I have given to the house of my God over and above all that I have prepared for the holy house. Even 3,000 talents of gold, of the gold of offer, and 7,000 talents of refined silver to overlay the walls of the house without. Even of his proper goods, of the gold of, of offer and, the refi and refined silver. These are even more provisions that will bring us into the fullness of God. And then verse 5. I'm going to stop at verse 10. We'll just read it. 1 Chronicles 29, verse 5. The gold of for things of gold and the silver for things of silver, for all manner of work to be made by the hands of the artificers. And then, this is where we will ask ourselves, we see, it says, and who then is willing, who then is willing to consecrate his service this day unto the Lord? And we pause, and we ask ourselves that question. By in light of the abundant provisions that has been made, are you willing to run had this race to live a life for God. You have no excuse. He says, I've made all these provisions. And then he stands in the congregation and he asks them, who then is willing? Through willing obedience 
shall we come into the fullness of God? Do you say, oh, I'm just small, young and tender. What do I have? What do I know? No way. He has made abundant provisions in his word. By his blood, by his word, by his Holy Spirit has given unto us. Are you willing? Glory to God. He says, draw me after you and let us run together. This is the race of the willing. That's why Psalm 110 says, my people shall be willing in the day of my power. And this is the day of the Lord's power. The day of, his Holy, of the Holy Ghost is the day of his power. And it says, my people shall be free will offerings. So we have to be willing. It's not about, is this thing working? Are you willing? Who then, the Spirit of the Lord is asking his church today, who then is willing to consecrate his service to working and following after me in their individual lives and consecrating his service to the house of God? No matter how small or how big it is, if it is a house that is fallen after the divine order, are you willing to give your service? Where are men and women to give their all for the house of the Lord, for the church? I'm talking about the church, our, our, our corporate assembly. If, we, if it's our house, how much are we willing to consecrate our service? Also, are you willing to consecrate your service to working with God, to yielding to the Holy Spirit, to in obedience to Christ in your life? So it's two ways individually and corporately. Who then is willing? May we be like the chief of the fathers in verse 6. It says, Then the chief of the fathers and princes of the tribes of Israel and the captains of thousands and of hundreds with the rulers of the king's work offered willingly. Glory. That is what the Lord is looking for. Willing offerers. Who will offer willingly, not by compulsion. Not that with the, they had to pursue you or beg you. No. That's why these days we don't patronize any man to follow Christ. But we pray for them that the Holy Ghost will touch their hearts and make them willing vessels. Isaiah, in Isaiah chapter 6, verse 8, heard a conversation of God, of the heavens speaking. Oh, glory to God. He said, who, who, who shall we send and who shall go for us? And Isaiah said, hey, hey, verse 8. He says, here I am, Lord, send me. Use me, cover me, as we sing. Hide me in thy counsel. I want to be where you are. And they gave the service, they gave for the service of the Lord, of the house of, of God, of gold 5,000 talents and 10,000 drums, and of silver 10,000 talents and brass 18,000 talents and 100,000 talents of iron, and so on and so forth. Verse 9, it says, Then the people rejoiced, for that they had offered willingly. Why? Because with a perfect heart, they offered willingly to the Lord. And David, the king, also rejoiced with great joy. This is the last verse I'm reading, verse 10. Wherefore, David blessed the Lord before all the congregation. And David said, Blessed be thou, Lord God of Israel, our Father, forever and ever. And then other utterances were made. Praise the name of the Lord. So who then is willing? And that's what the Lord is calling us today. The, a, a, call, a, a, a call for those who shall willingly obey by reason of the abundant provisions that have been made for things of gold. The things of gold will be worked in your life. The things of silver will be worked in your life. The things of brass will be worked in your life. The things of the precious stones. Who? Of the onyx stone shall be worked in us. You will live life in the spirit ease, with ease. Praying in the spirit. And giving glory and thanks to God who has made us victorious and conquerors. May the Lord grant us great help. And may the Lord cause us to be willing. To be willing offerings at this time. To offer willingly with a perfect heart. By reason of his abundant provisions unto us. As we worship the sting of death is broken. As we worship the sting of death is broken. Oh, we